You're listening to Audiology. Support this channel by becoming a member and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. The Incheon landing successfully positioned the United States 10th Corps behind the North Korean forces, known as the Korean People's Army. At the same time, the United States 8th Army was tasked with launching an all-out attack along its positions. This was done to engage and keep the main Korean People's Army forces occupied, ensuring they couldn't send reinforcements to the area under threat behind them. The objective was also to break through the encirclement by the Korean People's Army, which had trapped the 8th Army within the diminishing Pusan perimeter for six weeks. Should the 8th Army manage to break free, their next goal was to push northward and join up with the 10th Corps in the area around Seoul. Starting on September 6th, under the leadership of General Walton Walker, the 8th Army began planning an operation that became official by September 16th. This operation was timed to follow the Incheon landing by just one day, at 9 a.m. on September 16th. The plan was for the U.S. 8th and the South Korean armies to move along a specific route, Taegu Kumchan, Taejon Suwon, aiming to defeat North Korean forces they encountered and eventually join forces with the X Corps. A critical part of this operation was the new U.S. 1 Corps, positioned at the center of the perimeter, which was tasked with making the main breakthrough because it was closest to X Corps and had access to better roads, a key advantage for mechanized forces. The plan outlined specific roles for various divisions, including the U.S. 5th Regimental Combat Team and the 1st Cavalry Division, to establish a foothold over the Nok Tong River near Wagwan. This would enable the U.S. 24th Infantry Division to advance towards Kumchan Taejon, with the 1st Cavalry Division covering their rear. At the same time, the U.S. 25th and 2nd Infantry Divisions, along with the South Korean 2nd and 1st Corps, were positioned to engage North Korean forces, aiming to fix them in place and take advantage of any breakthroughs. Additionally, the South Korean 17th Regiment was moved from Pusan to Incheon to link up with X Corps. Support for establishing the bridgehead at Waigwan was complex due to limited engineering resources and equipment for bridging the Naktong River. There was only enough equipment for two pontoon treadway bridges. To bolster air support, the 5th Air Force, led by General Stratemeyer, received additional units from Okinawa, despite some air squadrons being redirected to support the Incheon operation. The strategy had its challenges, notably the 8th Army's inability to gather a large breakout force because much of its strength was tied down along the perimeter by North Korean forces. The initially free U.S. 24th Infantry Division had to be moved piece by piece to a central position before the operation could begin. This was a shift from defensive to offensive operations, without the chance for reinforcement or building a striking force. The plan considered a timely link-up with X Corps crucial, hoping the Incheon landing would demoralize the North Korean forces and bolster morale within the 8th Army. Interestingly, the paths envisioned for the 8th Army's breakout mirrored those the North Korean forces used for their southbound drive, with every escape road from the perimeter blocked by the North Korean forces. Key routes for the main effort included a highway leading from the Naktong River opposite Waiguan to Kumchon, and then across the Sobek Mountains to Taejon, along with other potential paths through valleys and mountainous sectors, providing various options for advancement towards strategic locations. Before the attack, the 8th Army was in charge of its four infantry divisions and additional smaller ground forces. As a part of getting ready, Far East Command decided to bring back the 1st and 9th Corps and add them to the Army. On August 2nd, General John B. Coulter kicked off the reactivation of the 1st Corps at Fort Bragg. By August 13th, Coulter and a team were in Korea setting things up, with the rest of the Corps joining by September 6th. The 9th Corps, under Major General Frank W. Milburn, started up at Fort Sheridan on August 10th. Milburn and a few officers flew to Korea on September 5th, but the rest of their team didn't make it until late September to early October. Both of these corps had previously served with the 8th Army in Japan, with the 1st Corps being in Kyoto and overseeing the 24th and 25th Divisions, and the 9th Corps in Sendai, managing the 1st Cavalry and the 7th Divisions. The 1st Corps was chosen as the primary force for the upcoming offensive. In a switch-up on September 11th, Walker had Milburn take over the 1st Corps in Taegu, while Coulter took the helm of the 9th Corps in Miryang the following day. By noon on September 13th, the 1st Corps was fully operational with the U.S. 1st Cavalry Division, 
the 5th Regimental Combat Team, and the Republic of Korea 1st Division on board. By the end of September 16th, it also included the British 27th Infantry Brigade, further bolstering its capabilities. In contrast, the 9th Corps faced a rocky start due to a lack of communication staff and equipment, leading to an operational delay. The signal battalion meant for them was redirected to the 10th Corps instead. It wasn't until 2 p.m. on September 23rd that the 9th Corps could finally jump into action, having received the U.S. 25th and 2nd Infantry Divisions along with their support units. However, their operations continued to struggle with communication challenges. Before launching their offensive, U.S. intelligence had a tally. The 8th Army was up against about 101,417 troops from the North Korean People's Army, comprising 13 infantry divisions, one armored division, and two armored brigades. Breaking it down, the North Korean People's Army 1st Corps, positioned in the south, boasted six infantry divisions plus armored units, totaling 47,417 men. Meanwhile, the 2nd Corps, stationed in the north and east, fielded seven infantry divisions with armored units, amassing 54,000 troops. The North Korean forces were thought to be at about 75% of their operational capacity in both manpower and equipment. Intelligence suggested that despite redirecting three divisions towards Seoul, the North Korean People's Army's perimeter defenses would remain solid, keeping them primed for offensive maneuvers. However, this assessment of North Korean People's Army capabilities turned out to be overestimated. Interrogations of prisoners of war and captured documents painted a less formidable picture. Key divisions like the 13th, 15th, 5th, and 7th had significantly fewer troops than estimated, and overall the North Korean People's Army had suffered massive losses by mid-September, with exact figures still elusive. According to historian Roy E. Appleman, the North Korean People's Army's strength around the perimeter in mid-September had dwindled to about 70,000 troops, retaining only up to 50% of their original heavy weaponry and tanks. Morale had hit rock bottom. Only 30% of the original forces remained, with seasoned soldiers desperately trying to maintain order among the ranks, which were largely filled by unwilling South Korean recruits. Food shortages only added to the despair, cited by prisoners as a major cause for their dwindled morale. Despite the harsh discipline, including execution for those who tried to flee or showed hesitance in battle, there were surprisingly few desertions, partly due to the fear of execution by enemy forces. By contrast, the combined strength of the 8th Army and the Republic of Korea Army stood strong at 140,000 combat-ready men in mid-September. The U.S. divisions numbered around 15,000 each, supplemented by 9,000 Republic of Korea recruits. The six Republic of Korea divisions each accounted for about 10,000 troops. In addition, the three corps headquarters collectively contributed at least another 10,000 soldiers, totaling the Allied forces to more than 150,000 men. On the morning of September 16th, the weather was awful. With murky skies and plenty of rain, this bad weather led to the cancellation of a planned heavy bombing on enemy positions in the Waigwan area by U.S. Air Force B-29 Superfortress bombers. The North Korean People's Army launched attacks in some areas, which stopped the United Nations forces from starting their planned offense at 9 a.m. That day didn't see many advancements. The Republic of Korea 15th Regiment of the 1st Division managed to make some headway near a fortified area north of Taegu. Meanwhile, after a tough fight, the U.S. 2nd Division moved forward five miles towards hills that overlooked the Naktong River, achieving the most success in a westward direction from Yongsan and Changnyong, with a three-regiment attack that pushed back three North Korean People's Army divisions across the Naktong. However, the U.S. 9th Infantry Regiment couldn't capture Hill 201. In another area, Company C of the U.S. 23rd Infantry Regiment was hit hard by a pre-dawn North Korean People's Army attack, losing 25 men, including all its officers. But after repelling an early morning attack on the 16th, the 3rd Battalion, with tank support, launched an attack at 10 a.m. and faced strong resistance until mid-afternoon when the North Korean People's Army began to pull back, suffering heavy losses from American fire. On the right flank, the U.S. 38th Infantry Regiment kept up with the central advance. North American F-51 Mustangs provided close air support, greatly aiding in the capture of Hill 208 near the Naktong River. In the afternoon, fighter planes targeted large groups of North Koreans retreating, 
causing significant casualties. As the night fell, the North Korean People's Army command post withdrew, along with several regiments and their artillery. This retreat continued into the next day, with the North Korean People's Army suffering heavily from continued airstrikes and abandoning much of their equipment and weaponry. By September 18th, the U.S. 2nd Battalion, 38th Infantry, unexpectedly secured a position on the west bank of the Naktong River two days ahead of schedule. American patrols had earlier found the high ground clear of North Korean People's Army forces. They quickly took control of a strategic hill with only light resistance, catching the North Koreans off guard. From their position, they spotted an estimated North Korean People's Army battalion in the distance. Air cover was requested for the next morning to protect the newly established bridgehead, which now included captured North Korean prisoners and a significant supply cache. Efforts were then made to strengthen and expand this bridgehead. By the end of September 18th, the U.S. 2nd Division had control over its assigned sector east of the Naktong, except for a couple of areas still held by the North Korean People's Army. Despite repeated attacks and bombardments, Hill 201 remained under North Korean People's Army control, as did the massive Hill 409. American forces were focused on containing these areas, while also dealing with isolated groups of North Korean People's Army soldiers in the rear of their sector. On September 14th, the 5th Regimental Combat Team, or 5th RCT, was assigned to work alongside the 1st Cavalry Division. They set themselves up west of Taegu, close to the Naktong River, about six miles away from Waigwan, and got ready for action. With 2,599 soldiers, the regiment was not at full strength, missing 1,194 men. Its battalions had nearly the same number of troops, between 586 and 595. On September 16th, they moved from their starting position to begin a mission crucial to the 8th Army's efforts to advance. Initially, only the 2nd Battalion confronted the North Korean People's Army northward toward Wayaguan along the Naktong River. However, by the end of the following day, the 3rd Battalion had also engaged in combat and the 1st Battalion was positioned to join in. The full regimental attack came on September 19th, targeting Hill 268 near Wayaguan. Defended by about 1,200 KPA soldiers and tanks, this area was critical. If the KPA lost this position, their forward locations facing east along the road to Tegu would be compromised due to its significance and the gap in their lines to the south, where British forces held crucial blocking positions. After fierce fighting throughout the day, the 5th RCT captured Hill 268, though not completely and made significant progress with the support of airstrikes that damaged and demoralized the KPA. Coordinated efforts with the 5th and part of the 7th Cavalry Regiment successfully protected the flanks and engaged in intense battles nearby. By the evening of September 18th, the 5th RCT and the 6th Medium Tank Battalion came under the control of the 24th Division. On September 19th, continuing the battle for Hill 268, more than 200 KPA soldiers still resisted in their bunkers until three flights of F-51s attacked the positions with napalm, rockets, and gunfire. This allowed the infantry to overrun the bunkers, leading to the death of a KPA regimental commander and about 250 soldiers. Meanwhile, others faced stiff resistance from the 2nd and 1st Battalions, resulting in significant KPA casualties. The 2nd Battalion made its way into Wayaguan by mid-afternoon, swiftly moving through the town after encountering and overcoming KPA forces. Following these actions, the KPA's defense around Wayaguan crumbled, leading to a disorderly retreat. Aerial observations reported large numbers of KPA troops fleeing the area, with roads filled with retreating groups. By this period, the 5th RCT had seized significant amounts of KPA weaponry and continued to push forward, capturing Hill 303 and suffering casualties along the way. The series of operations over five days led to the capturing of crucial objectives and inflicted severe blows to the KPA's 3rd Division, disrupting their positions and forcing a retreat. This successful campaign by the 5th RCT demonstrated their critical role in the broader effort to repel North Korean forces during this phase of the conflict. In September 1950, the 8th Army and 1st Corps had a major task at hand, breaking out from the Pusan perimeter. The plan was for the 24th Division, led by General John H. Church, to spearhead this move by crossing the Naktong River near the Hasandong Ferry area. 
just west of Taigu. General Church received his orders on September 17th. By this time, the 5th Regimental Combat Team had already secured the crossing point from potential enemy threats from the eastern shore. The operation was set to begin after dark on September 18th, utilizing assault boats from the 3rd Engineer Combat Battalion for the 21st Infantry Regiment. Their mission was to land on the far side and push northward, aiming to cut off a vital highway leading to Kumchan. They were not alone in this endeavor as the 24th Reconnaissance Company and the 19th Infantry Regiment also had their own crucial roles in blocking enemy movements from Songju. Before this operation could happen, the 24th Division faced another challenge, crossing the Kumho River, a tributary of the Naktong that lay along their path. On the morning of the 18th, it was discovered that a planned bridge was not in place, so they quickly adapted, using sandbags to fortify an underwater bridge and employing makeshift ferries for smaller vehicles. Despite these efforts, traffic bottlenecks developed, leading to doubts about meeting the crossing times initially planned for the Naktong River. Finally, in the early hours of September 19th, the operation commenced. The initial crossing was met with intense opposition, including machine gun, mortar, and artillery fire, especially from Hill 174. Despite these challenges and significant casualties, the forces managed to secure Hill 174 by noon thanks to a combination of ground assaults and air support. This marked a turning point, allowing subsequent forces to cross more safely and continue their mission with lighter resistance. Throughout this operation, the engineers played a critical yet perilous role, evidenced by the casualties suffered. Ten Americans and five Koreans killed, with many more wounded or missing. This operation showcased not just the fighting spirit of the troops involved, but also the complex logistics and challenges of military strategy and execution during the Korean War. On September 20th, the 19th Infantry tightened its grip on the strategic high ground west of the river, following the Songju Road. Meanwhile, the 24th Reconnaissance Company, having made a river crossing under the cover of night, moved ahead westward along the same road. On that day, the 1st Corps assigned the British 27th Infantry Brigade to the 24th Infantry Division, preparing it to cross the Naktong River and join the offensive. The British Brigade, now in the place of the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry Regiment, pushed north to the 19th Infantry's crossing point. By the afternoon, they began to cross over a hastily constructed footbridge, single file, despite being sporadically targeted by a well-placed Korean People's Army gun. This gun caused British casualties and disrupted supply efforts to the 19th Regiment, cleverly remaining silent to avoid detection by aircraft cover. By September 20th, the entire 24th Division, along with the British 27th Brigade, had made it across the Naktong. The division's units were strategically positioned around the Waiguan Kumchan Highway, ready for a westward push along the main highway leading to Taegu, Kumchan, Taejan, and Seoul. With division forces now on the river's west side, the next crucial step was to get transport, artillery, tanks, and service units across to back the westward advance. The Waiguan permanent bridges, wrecked in August by the 1st Cavalry Division, were unusable except for makeshift ladders allowing pedestrian crossing. Thus, building a robust bridge for heavy machinery became urgent. From September 20th, over a 36-hour non-stop effort, the 11th Engineer Combat Battalion and the 55th Engineer Treadway Bridge Company erected an M2 pontoon bridge across the 700 feet wide and 8 feet deep Naktong at Waiguan. This bridge was finished by 10 o'clock on September 22nd, enabling immediate traffic flow and ensuring most of the 24th Division's vehicles were on the west side by midnight. During the confrontations near Waiguan on September 20th and 21st, the Korean People's Army incurred significant losses, including tanks, other equipment, and troop numbers on both sides of the Naktong. The 24th Division reported 29 destroyed Korean People's Army tanks over these two days, though it's believed some had been taken out in earlier battles. According to Korean People's Army records, the 203rd and 107th Regiments of the 105th Armored Division were significantly reduced to only 9 and 14 tanks, respectively, as they pulled back towards Kumchan, still providing cover with the remaining tanks and infantry support. By September 22nd, the 24th Division was regrouped west of the Naktong, setting its sights on a 20-mile advance northwest to Kumchan, aiming at the heart of Korean People's Army field operations. Positioned just below the 24th Division, 
the second division was preparing for the 9th Infantry Regiment to secure Hill 201 on September 19th to bolster their efforts against a tough North Korean People's Army stronghold. Both the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 23rd Infantry were called into action. The 1st Battalion lent its support to the 9th Infantry at Hill 201, while the 2nd Battalion launched an offensive against Hill 174, another key defense point held by the North Korean People's Army. By the end of the evening, the persistent efforts paid off and the 9th Infantry had Hill 174 under control, clearing the path for the 2nd Division to cross the Naktong River. In the early hours of September 20th, the 3rd Battalion, 23rd Infantry crossed the river quietly, using assault boats near the Sangpo Ferry location, just a bit south from where the Sinban River merges with the Naktong from the west. This move was so surprising that Lima Company of the battalion managed to capture a North Korean People's Army Lieutenant Colonel and his staff while they were asleep. A captured map revealed the positions of the North Korean People's Army's 2nd, 4th, and 9th Divisions around Sinban-ni. By noon, Hill 227, overseeing the river crossing from the west, was taken. Later that day, the 1st Battalion, 23rd Infantry made their crossing, aiming for Hill 207, a strategically important location. The battalion encountered the Sinban River unexpectedly, leading to a delay. Eventually, they crossed using amphibious vehicles and took Hill 207 without facing opposition, as it was unguarded. The 3rd Battalion then fortified themselves on Hill 227. However, under the cover of a severe storm, a North Korean company launched a surprise attack in the morning of September 21st, causing significant casualties and dislodging one platoon from its position. Despite the initial setback, counterattacks before noon reclaimed the lost ground. On the same day, the 1st Battalion, with support from the 72nd Tank Battalion, pushed towards Sinban-ni against strong North Korean People's Army resistance, with air support significantly aiding their advancement. The action continued on the following days, with the 23rd Infantry facing tough battles but eventually capturing Sinban-ni on September 23rd. They were then ready to coordinate an advance with the 38th Infantry towards Hyopchon. Meanwhile, the 38th Infantry was engaged in intense combat against North Korean People's Army forces as they moved towards Chogya and Hyopchon, with aerial support playing a crucial role in overcoming enemy resistance. By September 22nd, the 2nd Division had successfully built a bridge over the Naktong River at the Sadung Ferry Site, spanning 400 feet, marking a significant logistical achievement and ensuring supply lines to support advanced units on the west side of the river. Near Taegu, fierce battles were ongoing between the South Korean and American forces, including the 1st Cavalry Division and the Republic of Korea 1st Division and the North Korean People's Army Divisions. The majority of the action was happening along two main approaches to Taegu. Firstly, near the Waegwon Taegu Highway and Railroad, where the 5th Cavalry Regiment was holding back the North Korean People's Army's advance, and secondly, along the Tabu Dong Road, where the fight to stop the North Korean People's Army from moving closer to Taegu had been intense for almost a month. This area saw nearly 200 of the 373 soldiers evacuated to Pusan on September 16th, highlighting the severity of the fighting there. General Hobart R. Gay had developed a strategy for the 1st Cavalry Division aimed at breaking through the North Korean lines. This plan involved protecting the 5th Regimental Combat Team's flank, maintaining pressure on the North Korean People's Army near Taegu, and potentially encircling a large number of North Korean People's Army forces if successful. Starting September 16th, Gay began repositioning forces, notably moving the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, to support these goals. In the initial days of the 8th Army's offensive, the 8th Cavalry Regiment and the North Korean People's Army's 13th Division were locked in a stalemate, particularly around Hill 570, a strategic position north of Taegu. Both sides struggled to gain any significant advantage, hindered by the rugged terrain and well-protected North Korean People's Army defenses. The reluctance to advance too quickly was out of concern for the high risk to troop lives. However, the slow progress of the 8th Cavalry Regiment was a source of frustration for higher commanders, leading to pressure on the 8th Cavalry to intensify its efforts. Despite reinforcements and orders to secure Tabudong, the 8th Cavalry faced stiff resistance from North Korean People's Army forces entrenched in strategic positions, 
resulting in significant setbacks and losses, including seven tanks from the 70th Tank Battalion on September 20th. Next to the 1st Cavalry Division, the South Korean 1st Division, under General Paik sun yup achieved notable progress. With the 12th Regiment and support from the United States 10th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Group, they exploited a weakness in the North Korean positions found in the high mountains. This maneuver allowed them to advance to a spot on the Tabudong Kunwi Road, which was 10 miles northeast of Tabudong and 13 miles ahead of the furthest units of the 1st Cavalry Division. Positioned behind the main forces of the North Korean 1st and 13th Divisions, they were ready to block one of their primary escape routes. This move forced the North Korean 1st Division to pull back its 2nd and 14th regiments from Kasan's southern slopes on September 19th to counter this new threat. Additionally, a South Korean company managed to reach the southern edge of the walled city. At the beginning of the United Nations offensive along the Waiguan Taegu Road, the 5th Cavalry Regiment attacked North Korean positions concentrated on Hills 203, 174, and 188. The North Korean 8th Regiment, with roughly 1,000 soldiers, defended these strategic spots. The battle commenced on September 16 with the 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry leading the charge, followed by the involvement of the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry the next day, aimed at Hill 253. In the intense fighting that ensued, Captain Fred P. DiPolina of G Company heroically stayed behind despite being wounded to ensure his men's escape. He fought bravely, killing six enemy soldiers before being killed himself in an ambush. Following these events, the two companies were pushed back south of the road. For three days, North Korean forces effectively defended Hill 203 from every assault attempt. During this period, the 70th Tank Battalion lost a significant number of tanks to mines, North Korean tank, and anti-tank fires. On September 18th, after heavy combat, Hill 203 was finally taken by the 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry. Yet the North Koreans continued to put up resistance from nearby hills, especially Hill 253, which remained a stronghold. This engagement severely depleted the ranks of the three rifle companies of the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry. North Korean mortar fire was notably effective, causing a majority of the casualties. On September 18th, a bombing run by 42 B-29 bombers targeted areas west and northwest of Waiguan across the Naktong River, but didn't seem to inflict any damage on the North Korean forces. The battle around the hills east of Waiguan culminated on September 19th, with fierce combat between United Nations forces and the North Koreans on hills 300 and 253. The 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry, managed to secure Hill 300, yet suffered 207 battle casualties, with 28 Americans killed, 147 wounded, and 4 missing in action. The effectiveness of the battalion was reduced to 30% by that afternoon. Despite these losses, the capture of Hills 300 and 253 by the 5th Cavalry significantly contributed to capturing Waiguan later that day. However, the North Korean forces on Hill 371 managed to fend off attempts to take the hill, maintaining their position for the time being. During its retreat from Weiguan to Sangju, the Korean People's Army 3rd Division's numbers drastically dropped from about 5,000 to roughly 1,800 due to significant losses and panic among the troops. The combined efforts of United Nations ground forces and airstrikes caused heavy casualties. In the aftermath, around Weiguan, the 5th Cavalry Regiment found 28 Korean People's Army tanks, including 27 T-34s and one United States M4 Sherman that had been used by the North Koreans, either destroyed or captured. By the 19th, with the tough battles east of Weiguan concluded, Gay began orchestrating a strategy to encircle the enemy. Lieutenant Colonel Klanos and his 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, moved from the division's right to its left flank, positioning ahead of the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, readying to move towards Tabudong. Gay then had the 3rd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, relocate from the right flank to the left the following morning, set to support the 1st Battalion's push for Tabudong. On the 20th of September, the 3rd Battalion set off by truck towards Waiaguan, but fears of Korean People's Army mortar and artillery strikes led them to dismount prematurely. The resulting foot march delayed their arrival and tired the troops a decision that frustrated Gay due to a similar cautious move made by the 2nd Battalion previously. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion embarked towards Waiguan, 
detouring onto a secondary road leading towards the Wagwan Tabudong Road, despite leading an armored advance, encountered roadblocks and enemy fire that slowed progress. When a tank hit a mine, halting the column entirely, Gay expressed his frustration over the delay, instructing the regiment's commander to have the 1st Battalion circumvent the Korean People's Army forces on the hills and quickly head for Tabudong. Following these orders, the 1st Battalion made it to the main road to Tabudong, navigating through a route littered with destruction, including dead animals, damaged tanks, and abandoned military supplies. By nightfall, as the battalion prepared to rest, an exploding mine wounded Klanos, who initially refused to leave but was eventually ordered to be evacuated the next day by the regimental commander. That evening, the 1st Battalion, closely followed by the 3rd, advanced to Togaidong, situated about four miles from Tabudong. The unplanned early dismounting of the 3rd Battalion was the final factor for Gay, leading him to replace the commander of the 7th Cavalry Regiment. On that evening, Colonel Harris, who was already leading the 77th Field Artillery Battalion supporting the regiment, was appointed as the new commander. Harris took charge just before the clock struck midnight and wasted no time. He gathered the battalion and unit leaders and laid out his orders around midnight. He directed that the 7th Cavalry was to take over Tabudong the next morning. He emphasized that the first group to reach the village should immediately head south to meet up with the 8th Cavalry Regiment and also secure defensive positions to safeguard the road. The following day, on September 21st, the 1st Battalion got moving again and reached the outskirts of Tabudong at nearly 1 p.m. They faced some resistance from the North Korean troops, but managed to clear the village by 4.35 p.m. by executing a successful pincer movement from the southwest and northwest. Shortly after, they pushed southward from Tabudong along the Taigu Road making their way towards the 8th Cavalry Regiment, and completing the encirclement later that day. At the same time, the 3rd Battalion of the 7th Cavalry made its way to Tabu Dong and turned north to set up defensive positions on both sides of the road. Meanwhile, troops from the Republic of Korea's 1st Division had cut off the Sangju Road north of Tabu Dong and were moving south towards the village. The Republic of Korea's 12th Regiment, which was leading the advance, had established a roadblock eight miles northeast, just below Kunwi. This strategic maneuver seemed to effectively isolate significant numbers of North Korean troops from the 3rd, 13th, and 1st Divisions in the mountains north of Taegu. The following day, September 22nd, saw further success as the 11th Regiment of the Republic of Korea 1st Division, alongside units from the South Korean National Police, took control of the walled city of Kasan. Additionally, elements of the Republic of Korea's 15th Regiment advanced to Tabu Dong from the north, where they joined forces with the 1st Cavalry Division, further solidifying their hold on the area. In the mountainous regions where South Korea's Army 2nd Corps was operating, the North Korean 8th Division was worn out and the 15th Division was nearly wiped out. The South Korean troops were tired as well, but they still had more strength than their adversaries and slowly began advancing northward. The South Korean 6th Infantry Division launched an attack on the North Korean 8th Division, a foe they had been holding at bay for two weeks. Over four days, they decisively defeated the division, which according to North Korean sources, led to about 4,000 casualties. Those who survived ran away in a chaotic retreat toward Yecheon. By September 21st, the South Korean 6th Division was moving north of Uihung with hardly any resistance. Similarly, the South Korean 8th Infantry Division, having recuperated, encountered little resistance moving north since the North Korean 15th Division had been virtually eliminated. In the war-torn area of Kigian Gangni Kyongju, within the South Korean 1st Corps sector, the Capital Division battled its way through Angangni Streets on September 16th the same day the United Nations offensive commenced. Moving forward, the South Korean 3rd Infantry Division reached the north bank of the Hyongsan River, near Pohangdong. The following day, a battalion from the 7th Infantry Division advancing from the west linked up with the Capital Division, closing a gap that had existed between the South Korean 2nd and 1st Corps for two weeks. As the North Korean 12th Division retreated north into the mountains, they fought hard, but eventually relinquished control of Kigye to the Capital Division by September 22nd, continuing their withdrawal to Andong. This division, originally comprising mainly Korean veterans from the Chinese People's Liberation Army, saw its numbers reduced to about 2,000 men. 
In contrast, the South Korean divisions enjoyed superior numbers, better supplies, daily air support, and around Po Hangdong, naval gunfire support. Notably, on the 16th, naval gunfire, particularly from the battleship USS Missouri, under Admiral Charles C. Hartman, significantly impacted by bombarding North Korean positions with its massive 16-inch guns. However, an attempt by South Korean troops to cross a bridge under machine gun fire resulted in many casualties, despite air and naval support minimizing some of the enemy's effectiveness. In another strategic maneuver, the South Korean Miryang Guerrilla Battalion, equipped with Russian-style weapons and trained for such operations, landed behind enemy lines near Pohangdong on the night of September 14th to 15th. Their mission to disrupt the North Korean 5th Division from the rear faced fierce opposition, leading to a significant rescue operation by the U.S. Navy, which saved many from being completely overrun. Despite this setback, the South Korean 3rd Division captured Pao Hangdong on the morning of September 19th and continued to push northward with naval and air support, capturing additional territories and pushing the North Korean 5th Division back in disarray. On the morning of September 16th, over at the Masan area, on the left side of the United Nations forces, the 25th Division found itself still in combat with North Korean forces positioned behind its lines. The North Koreans seemed to be in a stronger position than before on the heights of Battle Mountain and the areas of Pilbongsan and Sobuksan. The division's leader, General William B. Keane, together with his team, thought that moving forward towards Chinju was only possible if the mountainous central part of their front was free of enemy forces. They remembered well the challenges faced by Task Force Keane back in early August when North Korean forces had managed to surround them from the mountains. It was clear to them that securing the center, where the North Koreans were positioned on the heights and regularly attacking the 24th Infantry Regiment, was crucial. The 27th and 35th Infantry Regiments, located on the left and right side and covering the roads between Chinju and Masan, couldn't proceed until the situation with the 24th Infantry improved. In response, General Keane on September 16th set up a specialized battalion-sized task force under the command of Major Robert L. Woolfolk of the 3rd Battalion, 35th Infantry. This force was tasked with reclaiming the heights of Battle Mountain and Pilbong San from the North Koreans the following day. On the 17th and 18th, Woolfolk's team made multiple assaults on these positions, supported by heavy artillery fire from the 8th and 90th Field Artillery Battalions and numerous airstrikes. Despite these efforts, heavy automatic fire from the North Koreans repelled their advances each time, resulting in significant casualties, including 57 losses for a company of the 27th Infantry alone. After repeated setbacks, Woolfolk's force ceased their attempts to dislodge the North Koreans from the high grounds on the 18th, and the task group was disbanded on the next day. However, by the morning of September 19th, it was discovered that the North Koreans had vacated the top of Battle Mountain overnight. This allowed the 1st Battalion of the 24th Infantry to move in and secure it. The 35th Infantry also started to advance, encountering minimal resistance until they approached the area in front of Chunggumni. There they were ambushed by North Korean soldiers concealed in spider holes who attacked the 1st Battalion from behind. By the next day, the 1st Battalion had taken Chungamni, and the 2nd Battalion established control over a ridgeline extending from Chungamni to the Nam River. In the meantime, the left flank, where the 27th Infantry was positioned, saw intense combat as they worked to push forward. On September 21st, the 35th Infantry Regiment secured the notch southwest of Chungamni. They then moved westward for eight miles without encountering resistance, past the road fork at Mushanni and reached the strategic high ground near the Chinju Pass. They halted there at 10.30 p.m. Simultaneously, the 24th and 27th regiments made progress in the center and on the left flank, their advance primarily slowed by the difficult terrain. They passed numerous previously defended positions, now abandoned by the North Koreans who had fought fiercely there before, and noted extensive defensive preparations by the North Koreans in the hills. Over the past few days, it has become clear that the forces of the Korean People's Army facing the 25th Division have started pulling back since the night of September 18th to 19th. Specifically, the Korean People's Army's 7th Division moved back from the south side of the Nam River, and the 6th Division adjusted its positions to cover the entire front line. By the early hours of September 19th, 
the 7th Division had made it across to the north side of the river, a move made possible by the cover provided by the 6th Division, which later also withdrew from its positions around Sobuksan. Despite this large-scale withdrawal, some Korean People's Army units and scattered soldiers remained behind in the mountains. For instance, on the morning of September 22nd, a few North Korean soldiers managed to sneak into the campsite of a company, 24th Infantry. In a startling encounter, a platoon leader woke up to find an opposing soldier right over him, managing to fend off the attacker with help until the assailant was shot by someone else. Another tragic incident involved a grenade being dropped into a foxhole, resulting in two soldiers killed and another wounded. Additionally, a mortar attack disrupted a meeting among company commanders, causing seven casualties, including the death of the commanding officer of headquarters company. On the same day, parts of the Korean People's Army's 6th Division held up the 35th Infantry's progression at Chinju Pass, effectively blocking them for the entire day on September 22nd. This action was to provide cover for the main force withdrawing across the Nam River and through Chinju, situated roughly six miles west. Despite a valiant effort, the assault teams of the 1st Battalion, 35th Infantry, could only get within 200 yards of the summit of Hill 152 at the pass, unable to push any further due to the resistance. On September 22nd, reports from the sky didn't give a clear picture of what the North Korean People's Army was planning. There were sightings of large groups moving both north and south within their ranks. On that same day, intelligence from the 8th Army couldn't confirm if the enemy was in full retreat across all fronts. They noted, although the enemy is apparently falling back in all sectors, there are no indications of an overall planned disengagement and withdrawal. This interpretation turned out to be incorrect. The North Korean People's Army were indeed pulling back orchestrating their retreat with strategic rearguard actions to slow down the United Nations forces wherever they could. The Incheon landings, a major operation by the United Nations on September 15th, had a significant demoralizing effect on the North Korean People's Army, perhaps the most critical factor leading to their quick downfall. Surprisingly, most North Korean People's Army officers and almost all the soldiers near the Pusan perimeter were kept in the dark about the Incheon landings for about a week. It seems it wasn't until Seoul was under direct threat, a few days post Incheon, that the North Korean leadership decided to pull back from the Pusan perimeter and regroup further north. The fighting patterns and actions by the North Korean People's Army around the perimeter are telling of this decision. On September 16th, when the 8th Army launched its offensive, only certain areas led by the 38th and 23rd Infantry Regiments made significant progress by cutting through weakened North Korean People's Army ranks to reach the Naktong River. Until September 19th, the United Nations forces faced fierce resistance from the North Korean People's Army, with little to show for their efforts besides mounting casualties. It was during the night of September 18th to 19th that the North Korean People's Army's 7th and 6th Divisions began pulling out from the most southerly sections of their line, leaving behind strong forces to cover their withdrawal. On September 19th, the U.S. 5th Regimental Combat Team took Waegwon and north of Taegu, the Republic of Korea's 1st Division, outflanked the North Korean People's Army's 1st and 13th Divisions, signaling their retreat. Following this, the Republic of Korea's 3rd Division reclaimed Pohangdong on the east coast, prompting rapid northward withdrawal of North Korean People's Army forces. By September 21st, significant ground was finally gained by the United Nations forces, including the recapture of Tabudong by the 1st Cavalry Division. Through these days, the U.S. 2nd Division engaged with North Korean People's Army delaying units, further signaling the broad withdrawal. The aftermath of the Incheon landings and the ensuing battles for Seoul had a clear impact on the North Korean People's Army's stance at the Pusan perimeter by September 19th. The North Korean leadership started pulling back its troops from the south towards the north. By September 23rd, this retreat was in full motion across the perimeter, effectively breaking the North Korean hold. Following this, the 8th Army and the Republic of Korea forces initiated a counteroffensive to chase down the retreating. North Korean People's Army Forces. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.